Okay, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to the 2023 20, Annual General Meeting for Manitoba Canola Growers. For you, for anyone here that doesn't know me, my name is Chuck Fossey and I'm the president of Manitoba Canola Growers. So I will call the meeting to order at this time. And I'd also at this time like to recognize some special guests we have in the audience today. We have Andre Harp from Alberta Canola Producers. We have uh, Brett Halstead from Saskatchewan Wheat Commission, and he is a former Saskatchewan Canola Director. We have uh, Jim Everson from Canola Council. We have Rick White from Canola Growers, and they will be speaking later on the, the meeting. And we also have Gord Kerbis from Canada Grains Council here. So, and anyone, I hope that I missed anyone, I apologize, but those were the people I saw this morning when I got in. So we are really excited to be together again in person and happy to offer virtual option to members as well. Just a few reminders before we get the meeting going. Voting members will be asked to vote using your voting cards. That's those white cards that you're given uh, when you registered. And you can also vote virtually, or those that are attending virtually can uh, also vote on motions and resolutions. Unofficial results of vote will be announced and visible to members. Votes will be audited and verified after the meeting with official results captured in the meeting minutes. We have time scheduled throughout the meeting to address questions. We ask those in the room to please use the floor mics so that everyone in the room and joining us virtually can hear your questions. For those of you online, you can type your questions using the Q&A feature and let us know what you want to speak to as a question by ask by using the Q&A feature and typing I have a question for or about. Everyone should have received a link to our AGM package prior to the meeting. If you have not had time to look up, uh, look at it, you can find it in your printed package here in the room or through the links found in the chat if you are online. As I said, the meeting will be recorded along with all questions and comments. If for some reason we are unable to answer or get a question, uh, answer a question, we will reach out and follow up after the meeting. Now with all the details out of the way, we can get started. So, as I said earlier, my name is Chuck Posse. I farm just west of Winnipeg in Starbuck, and I'm currently the president of Manitoba Canola Growers. And our vice president is Clayton Harder, who farms east of the city around St. Clements. Jack Fraze is our treasurer, and he farms at Winkler. Our secretary is Bill Nicholson from Shoal Lake. We round out our board of directors with Pam Bailey from Dakota, Nicolia Dow from Portage La Prairie, Jackie Dudgeon from Darlingford, and Jackie is attending the meeting virtually, and Warren Ellis from Owenisa. Up next, I would like to introduce you to our staff. Normally, we would be introducing our executive director, Delaney Ross Burtniak, but she is on medical leave and cannot attend today. Jennifer Dick is our market development director, and she is helping out covering Delaney's uh, normal duties and helping out, helping me stumble through this meeting. Uh, Leanne Campbell is our communications uh, senior manager. Unfortunately, she is on bereavement leave and also cannot attend. Amy Delacky is our research manager. Uh, she is currently on maternity leave, but she is in the meeting here today. Uh, our current research manager is Sonia Wilson. Karina Lepp is our grower engagement and extension manager. Our finance coordinator is Oxana Terran. Carrie Livingston is, is our communications coordinator. She's over inside here. Samantha Simone Vieira is our checkoff and member administrator. And Brenda Dick is our event and office administrator. And she's right in the back there. So our agenda, we are now going to move into the approval of the agenda. I hope you have ha all had time to review the agenda 
and that was provided in your package and is on the screen now. At this time, I would ask, are there any additions to the agenda? Okay. Are there any uh, changes to the agenda from our virtual? Okay, thank you. Seeing no additions, I would now look to adopt the agenda as presented. Can I get a mover? Okay, uh, Pam Bailey and a seconder, Robert Mis Misko. Yeah, sorry, Robert. Sometimes I forget names. <laughs> okay. All in favor of adopting the motion as, as presented? Any opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Okay, we'll move on to the minutes. Referring to the minutes from our 2022 AGM sent out prior to the meeting, I would ask if there are any errors or omissions to the minutes. Nothing from our virtual audience, I think. So I'd like to call for a motion to adopt the minutes of our February 17th, 2022 AGM. Can I get a mover and a seconder? Yes, Boris and a seconder. Oh, Rory, Rory Quality, thank you. Okay, any amendments? Okay. I think I will call for the motion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, no, no opposition, I declare that one carried. Okay. Well, we, no, I would like to take a minute to thank the other provincial grower groups for working with us to put Crop Connect on again this year. We value our partnerships with other commodity groups, Working together, we are able to put on a great conference and host our AGMs in a user-friendly and cost-effective manner. And I think it's really been great us all getting back together in person. And I've seen a lot of people renewing connections, catching up on what's been happening over the last couple of years. Partnering also allows us to work with amazing people like Elena from Planners Plus and Ron and Adam from Artisan who are all quietly working behind the scenes today and for months prior to make this event happen. So uh, this time I, I'd like to remind you that if you are planning to bring forward a resolution from the floor, please do so as soon as possible before we get to the, that portion of the meeting. Procedures are found on your table and, out, and online at the link provided in the chat. And if you do have a resolution, uh, take it over to the side here to carry so that we can get a slide prepared for when we do get into the resolutions. It is now time to share our 2021-22 annual report, highlighting programs, events, and successes from August 21st to July 22nd. This will be immediately followed by updates from our national partners at the Canadian Canola Growers Association and the Canola Council of Canada. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to address them following these three reports. Those joining virtually can type your questions into the Q&A feature, closely, uh, clearly stating who the question is for. So at this time, we will start our report video. The Manitoba Canola Growers Research Program focuses on investing in projects and programs that match farm priorities and have a clear return on investment for you, Manitoba's canola farmers. In the last fiscal year, we supported research with a focus on canola-specific topics and overarching themes that will help support a whole farm approach to on-farm decision-making. Bringing the research even closer to the farm, we established and launched a canola on-farm research pilot program during the 2022 growing season. The program is focused on helping you make meaningful production decisions on your farm using scientific research methods. 
Three protocols were set up with 12 different sites across the province, looking at optimal nitrogen rates, optimal seeding rates, and disease control through a bio-inoculant trial. Connecting research back to the farm was a top focus and the driver behind this year's inaugural canola research camp. To help build connections between researchers and farmers, we took eight researchers to six farms to discuss and experience the variability in production practices, challenges of the current growing season, and concerns looking into the future. Valuable questions around how on-farm decisions are made directed conversations toward how you can use research results on your operation, and what future research topics have the potential to make the largest impact on your farm. Research and agronomy have always been amongst the most important and valuable program areas serving canola farmers in Manitoba. Thanks to a strong canola research network, we look forward to bringing even greater value back to you by connecting your specific needs with research results and agronomic recommendations. We are committed to being the voice of Manitoba canola farmers to Canadian consumers. Through our partnership with SAS Canola and Alberta Canola, we run the National Canola Marketing Program, known as Canola Eat Well. Canola Eat Well builds demand for canola and fosters conversations between the farmers that grow canola and those that choose it for their kitchens. So your canola oil is going to go in. Mm -hmm. Delicious Canadian canola oil, local choice. Activating a full spectrum of digital communication tools, we are connecting with tens of thousands of consumers, impacting the Canadian canola market, including politicians and the general public through monthly newsletters, social media channels, and our flagship website. Focusing on a community of highly engaged food influencers, the Ambassador Program activated six key opinion leaders. Hi, I'm Andrew. These leaders appeared on social media, television and radio, both nationally and in the greater Toronto area, sharing a consistent message. Choose canola oil for your kitchen because it is versatile, affordable, healthy, and 100% Canadian. Sharing a passion for cooking with Canadian ingredients, our award-winning recipe booklet was launched. Over 40,000 copies were distributed, with 30,000 reaching Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta homes through the Farm to School Vegetable Fundraiser. Working together with the Canadian Canola Growers Association, new sustainability content for consumers was launched on the Canola Eat Well website. A user-generated video was created from footage gathered directly from Canadian farms to amplify the messaging that was shared during Canada's Agriculture Day. The Canola Eat Well program has been undergoing an exciting phase of growth this past year that has required a lot of planning and preparation. We are ready to launch into the next era of marketing canola to Canadians. Designed to support and engage farmers, our programming is tailored throughout the year to connect you with learning opportunities and resources that can be used to improve profitability and enhance sustainability on your farm. Covering a variety of topics, our events provide you with an opportunity to learn from other farmers and experts in their fields. Virtual events were held, including a six-part Canola Watch webinar series covering genetics and the environment, management, maximizing hybrid potential, pests and beneficial insects, nutrient management, herbicide updates, and maximizing plant stands. We also held a three-part policy webinar series with a focus on rail transportation, influencing policy in a changing landscape, and navigating grain contracts. And after the cancellation of Manitoba Ag Days, our panel discussion on flea beetle management was moved to a virtual webinar format. 
In-person events returned with Combine College being held in Dauphin and Portage La Prairie, providing a hands-on experience looking at combine settings, reducing harvest losses, and maximizing harvest efficiency. As supporters of the Be Grain Safe program, we saw firefighters in Carberry, Gilbert Plains, and St. Anne take part in the Firefighter Grain Rescue Training Course, preparing them to respond to grain entrapment incidents. Growth and professional development is what keeps you on the leading edge of your businesses and positioned as a leader in the agriculture community. We look forward to facilitating more farmer-to-farmer -farmer connections and learning opportunities so you can continue to drive success for your operation. We recognize that the success of the canola industry hinges on strong leadership and advocacy for canola, from the time it's planted in the field to when it's consumed and all steps in between. We work directly with the government and partners to amplify the voice of farmers on key issues by speaking up at consultations, workshops, and committee meetings. Over the past year, we actively shared your values, successes, feedback and concerns through sustainability workshops and many consultations on biofuels, climate change, water management, fertilizer emission targets and code of practice. Working with our national partners at the Canadian Canola Growers Association, Canola Council of Canada and provincially with the Keystone Agricultural Producers allows us to amplify the voice of Manitoba canola farmers and bring it forward on both provincial and national issues. Your voice is highly valued and when delivered strategically in a compelling and unified way can be the catalyst needed for positive policy decisions. It is our role to continually monitor, evaluate and discuss policies that will drive positive change for farmers in Manitoba and position you as bold leaders and experts, allowing you to show up where it counts and have your voices heard. Okay, we will now move into reports from our two national canola associations. Up first, I would like to Rick, welcome Rick White, President and CEO of the Canadian Canola Growers Association, which is a national agricultural policy organization and an administrator of the Cash Advance Payments Program. Jack Fraze and Clayton Harder are sit on the CCGA Board of Directors representing Manitoba Canola Growers alongside the other provincial canola grower groups. And we look forward to welcoming, welcoming Pam Bailey this month as a new director to CCGA. So, Rick. Well, uh, thank, thank you, Chuck. Uh, thank you for the invitation by MCGA. Pleasure to be here and uh, good chilly morning to everyone. Um, I will be quick because I think I have about five minutes. Um, I noticed uh, on the report from the MCGA that there's a lot of similarities in what I'm going to say in the next five minutes, which is an indication of the close collaboration that CCJ has, um, not only with MCJ and our other provincial members, but also the Canola Council of Canada. So there's a lot of commonality. We focus at the national level more so though. Maybe as a quick update on the APP um, 2022 program, uh, that is the advanced payments program, the cash advance program. We've uh, winding down now the 22 program. We're at 8,700 advances for $2.23 billion issued this year. The $250,000 interest free um, uh, given by the minister of this program um, will be extended for the 2023 program. So there's another year of uh, 250,000 interest free under the program and all indications that that will go back to 100,000 for the 2024 program. And so anyway, just a quick update on that. And our number is high on the 2.23 billion, partly because of the 250,000 interest free that farmers came in bigger way for advances. And secondly, prices are high, so we can advance a lot on a ton of grain now. So those two are the drivers behind that big number. 
Okay, on to uh, policy development. Uh, just a quick overview of the areas that we work in um, nationally um, on your behalf. And um, I'll try to get through these seven uh, major policy areas. There's a lot within each one, but I'll just give you a quick sense for what we're working on in those areas. On trade and global advocacy, um, we work very closely, not only with Canola Council on this, but the Canadian Agri-Food Trade Alliance. Um, that's our main uh, venues for uh, getting the trade message out there because trade is so critically important for canola farmers and the canola industry as a whole. Also, we're doing advocacy um, um, on trade through the International Agri-Food Network. This is a global uh, organization that we've been a part of for quite a few years now. We're uh, going with them and through them to get changes to codex at the international level for MRL establishment and the Sustainable De Development Goals of the UN. So that's kind of the trade and the global stuff um, together on marketing. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work um, and have been for quite a few years now on the Canada Grain Act review, um, which implicates and, and affects the Canadian Grain Commission. I see Patty is here today uh, with us from the Canadian Grain Commission. Um, so we do work on what changes may need to be done. We work closely with the commission to make sure that farmers' interests are, are heard, understood, and taken into account in some of the changes that may be coming forward. Um, but this legislation has come and gone so many times, um, <laughs> it dies in the order of paper regularly. Grain contracts ties into this area as well. Uh, we've done a lot of work and extension on that. Um, and a, uh, Janelle uh, Whiteley, uh, she is our main uh, senior policy manager on both the trade and the marketing files for us. On uh, transportation, um, we're heavily involved in that, have been for decades. Um, we are still a driving force and a major funder of the Ag Transport Coalition, which measures uh, railway performance. We're a member of Fields on Wheels, um, national, uh, an annual conference here in Winnipeg focused on transportation. Um, I, we're also involved, uh, I'm the co-chair of the Crop Logistics Working Group, uh, industry co-chair, I should say. The industry gets together with the government to talk about rail transportation through this committee um, two or three times a year at least. So actively involved there. On number four, biofuels, um, the clean fuel regulations uh, will replace the clean fuel standard on July 1st of this year. Um, we are very closely working tightly with uh, Canola Council on this um, to make sure they get it right. Um, land use and biodiversity criteria always up for discussion and debate and will be ongoing as uh, updates uh, to that will occur in the future. And the LCA model, the life cycle analysis model, always these things make a difference because it, it determines the effectiveness of the policy and the accessibility of farmers into that market. So we are watching that and working very closely with our colleagues uh, to influence the government on this one. Number five, um, oh, so those two policy uh, areas, transportation biofuels, our uh, senior manager on that is Steve Pratt. And uh, we again, we work very closely with Jim and his gang. On number uh, five, with the environment and sustainability, that's a huge file for us now. Um, we have uh, established the Ag Carbon Alliance, um, spearheaded by our, our uh, Ottawa office to bring together farm groups on the Ag Carbon Alliance. Main focus there right now is Bill C-234, had a major influence, and that's the exemption for carbon tax on, on uh, fuel used to dry grain and heat um, animal barns. So that is in place at third reading. It should soon be through the House at third reading, hopefully, and it then goes to the Senate for three readings in the, in the Senate as well. We are shepherding that very, very closely at every step politically. And uh, so that's that. Code of practice, we'll call it something different. We don't know what the name of it is yet, but uh, that is certainly been modified in the newest version uh, from the good farmer input that everyone receives. So thank you for that. Um, it is coming, it is revised, it hasn't been renamed, but there is a new version that will be out soon and it better reflects the input that was received. Um, there's more of a story to it um, coming through this new version, talking more about the successes, but it's still going to be a framework for 
sustainability at the end of the day, but his uh, feedback has certainly been valuable. And um, there's more to come on that. And those are, there's, please keep your input and feedback coming on that. So uh, Justine Raptus is our manager on that policy file. And um, other things like the Canadian uh, Sustainable Ag Strategy, this is the federal strategy going on right now. We've been putting input to the government on that. There is an open session for farmers. Mark it in your calendars for March 10th for Manitoba farmers. Uh, there will be a consultation for farmers to provide in, in, input directly to the federal government virtually. In Saskatchewan, that date will be February 24th for Saskatchewan farmers in the room here. So uh, on crop inputs, uh, that area kind of encapsulates fertilizer sanctions uh, or fertilizer availability, fertilizer pricing. Um, it includes plant breeding innovation. It includes our watering, water monitoring, all those crop inputs that you need as, as farmers to do the good job that you do. I also call it uh, innovation and science. And so that gets us also into the PMRA issues, evaluations, reevaluations. We all know how that imp how important that is. So that's the policy development area. So we're doing all this wonderful policy, but it's not just an academic exercise for it. We turn it into advocacy. So that's the next slide here is what are we doing on advocacy with all this great information and expertise that we have? We work very, very collaboratively, first internally, collaboratively, um, our GR team in Ottawa is almost seamless with our policy development uh, team in Winnipeg and our communications team in Winnipeg as well. Those three departments of CCJ work as a unit to be an effective um, uh, advocacy on all these issues to get the farmer's voice to where it is needed the most and work collaboratively, not only internally, but externally. And it's all to increase the awareness and further advance the issues and be more effective and coordinated. Starting with the provincial members, uh, coordinating with them, getting their feedback. The Grain Growers of Canada, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, those are the main inputs for farm farmer uh, views we get. Um, then we go to the industry, of course, Canola Council of Canada, right up top and center of that, because we work closely with them in all this and coordinate with them as well and collaborate. Pulse Canada, Cereals Canada, Canada Grains Council. Um, you know, I mentioned the Ag Carbon Alliance. That's another alliance. The ATC, I mentioned that on the railways. That's another collaboration of moving the needle. CAFTA, Canada Grains Council uh, being uh, chair of that. We have some influence there. A couple months left in my tenure there. Gord Kervis is here, so we'll hear from him. And uh, the Canadian... Uh, Chamber of Commerce, we're also a member of that. So those are the venues and the International Agri-Food Network. So those are the venues that we kind of extend and work with others because you can't do this stuff alone. But we have been extremely busy. Um, we, um, as CCJ, we're the top lobbyist in Canada in 2022. Um, so that means that we have been extremely active. Canola Council is also in the top 10 lobbyists for 2022. So between us and Canola Council of Canada, the politicians and the designated public office holders have heard a lot from us this year. And that is um, regardless of, of industry. So top lobbyists, regardless of industry in Canada. And so accolades to our team and Canola Council because we're up near the, we're all up near the top. Just to wrap it up here, the main issues that we lobby on and advocate for is environmental sustainability, trade and market diversification, business risk management, transportation, biofuels, crop inputs, regulatory modernization, and we also make appearances at the Fed Broad Territorial Meeting. Very short, top level summary. There's a whole bunch more underneath that. Please read about it in Building Connections. This is our year in review. Kelly has some of our our document there um, at the back of the room. If you want a hard copy, it's on our website too, but this has a lot more information on all those pieces that I touched on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. And you can see that Rick is a very busy person. And I got to tell you that I've worked with many of uh, Rick's staff people and they are truly experts who are looking after the interests of 
Manitoba and Canadian farmers, not just canola producers, but all farmers. So up next is Jim Everson to share his report as the president of the Canola Council of Canada, which represents the entire canola value chain, including exporters, processors, and life science companies. Farmers are also represented on the board. I currently sit on the Canola Council board as your Manitoba representative. So Jim, if you come forward. So thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Chuck. Uh, thanks for having us at the Canola Council at the uh, annual general meeting today. And I uh, really appreciate the time to talk. I, I also wanted to, uh, I'm glad Chuck did the introduction to who the Canola Council is. And I wanted to acknowledge Chuck, Chuck's uh, work as a director of the Canola Council. The Chuck is very engaged in bringing the grower voice to the board of directors, the value chain board of the Canola Council. He's the chair of our sustainable supply committee, which deals with our, our crop uh, issues, the agronomy issues and so on, and uh, is on the executive of the Canola Council board as well. So um, uh, Manitoba's voice is very strong on the value chain table. I've, um, I, I take it's kind of a similar approach that Rick did to kind of the major activities we undertake. We, we come at a lot of the work that we do as a Canola Council in terms of our access to global markets. We're exporting 90% of what we grow in, in Canada, so predictable market access and dealing with all the issues associated with that is, is kind of our bread and butter at the Canola Council. And it really starts with supporting growers in producing canola to meet the demand that we have uh, for canola globally, which is strong and which looks to be strong for the, for the foreseeable future with uh, uh, increasing uh, global demand just for vegetable oil generally, even, even during the pandemic. Uh, demand for vegetable oil globally increased um, despite all of the shutdowns of restaurants and that sort of thing that took place during that period of time. And then on top of that, there's conflict in Europe and uh, there is uh, a new, um, you know, the, the world is calling on our industry to provide solutions around the environment. And, and we are stepping up through the biofuels area where we're contributing a low pro carbon food feedstock that is going to help reduce GHG emissions and transportation fuels all through North America. And um, so that is also creating demand that I think is going to be good for the grower and good for the industry over the next period of time. So it really starts with supporting the grower. Um, we have a team of agronomists across the growing region that are directly in touch with growers on a daily basis and with the, the agronomy networks uh, in order to support uh, growers there. Our 2022 and uh, this year, a lot of that acti activity, especially here in Manitoba, revolves around solutions to the flea beetle issues and verticillium wilt, um, where um, you know we bring the group together to look at what the experience is that growers are having, to look at the both the short term and longer term research priorities we have to understand those diseases, and to and then to work and translating that research work into. Uh, best management practices and solutions that growers can deploy on their farm and help and then work very closely with the provincial commissions in communicating that work out to their grower members. Um, so you saw in the video that Manitoba canola growers put together uh, a lot of uh, photographs and so on of the work being done to produce canola watch during the growing season and um, to take that work and the advice that comes from that and best management practices and communicate that out to, to growers. So that's the that's the significant part of the work we do uh, there. Um, and then market access, trade and promotion. So it's really a significant part of the work the Canola Council does. Um, in 2022, the, the year that we're reporting on, much of that activity revolved around the, the renewable fuels area. Uh, Rick talked about the work being done on the Canadian fuel regulations. Um, it, it is a regulatory plan for using low carbon feedstock in, in biofuels in Canada, and it, really a great close working relationship with the CCJ at the national level, um, uh, where we have Chris Vervate, who's uh, with the executive director of the Canadian Oil Seed Processors Association, and also on my senior management team at the Canola Council, worked really closely with Steve Pratt and uh, continues to work on that issue um, to ensure that the regulations are in place are really uh, uh, a positive for the grower and uh, contribute to the, the growth of that industry in Canada. 
But at the same time, uh, we also focused on the United States. And uh, last year, uh, late last year, the Environmental Protection Agency provided a pathway for Canadian canola into the renew renewable fuels um, system into the United States. There is there is very, very significant investment being made, as you probably know, by by processing industry and particularly by the fuel industry, uh, the oil and gas business and gas retailers in uh, the development of the renewable fuels industry in the United States, which will create you know, really great market opportunities for Canadian canola into the North American renewable fuel space. So uh, in that in that regard, we worked with the U.S. Canola Association and with a consortium of oil and gas companies in the United States. Interesting that uh, in this whole area of biofuels over the last decade, that uh, it's always been a challenge working with the oil and gas business who felt that the government's regulation in this area was a challenge to their industry. That that's really changed, and in in uh, in all of North America, the oil and gas and the gas retailers and so on, because the compliance requirements they have to meet environmental standards are really on side, and are looking for opportunities to have feedstock choices uh, for the development of uh, of uh, fuel for domestic uh, fuel consumption in the future. And so they're very keen on having canola as a feedstock, and we've been able to cultivate a coalition of partners in the United States to help bring about this, these uh, regulatory solutions. So uh, a, a big part of the program last year was doing that, ensuring that we have the Environmental Protection Agency regulations in place. And now, you know, also during, um, putting some of that attention into some of the states, uh, California particularly is a, a very progressive when it comes to environmental sustainability, population larger than Canada. Um, and they have a clean fuel, a low carbon fuel standard that they're putting in place. And so we're also doing work there to make sure that canola is recognized in that regulatory pathway. So a lot of, a lot of effort there. Another thing that was a success in 2022 was working with the government of Canada. And in this case, we partnered with Cereals Canada and Pulse Canada to uh, put more resources into market access and regulatory issues in Asia. So you may have seen that uh, uh, earlier this year, the government announced a new, what they call Indo-Pacific strategy. And it includes an investment in new resources specifically for agricultural trade in Asia. So when we look at the landscape for growth in our markets, um, the biggest opportunity for growth because of population growth and because of uh, disposable income um, growth in, in Asia is the Asian marketplace. We already, you know, very reliant on markets in China and Japan. Um, but there is there is real opportunity in markets like Vietnam and Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia, and so on. So um, we're really focusing our trade agenda, um, negotiations of free trade agreements. There's one on now between Canada and Indonesia. Um, there's also an Asian trade agreement, which will bring in some of the Asian countries that are not already duty-free because of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we're... Um, involved in supporting the government of Canada in negotiations with those markets. Um, and the um, Asia Pacific office that they've announced for agriculture marketing is gonna be really helpful to keeping in touch with the regulators and policymakers in those markets where we wanna, where we wanna have growth in the future. Um, and so we're really pleased that we were able to uh, work with the government of Canada to put that, those resources in place. And then innovation is another, just the third pillar of the work that we do, and that I would break into really two large categories. The first is helping to coordinate research, agronomy research, with the provincial grower commissions. Um, you've seen in, in the video earlier the effort uh, Manitoba canola growers put into research. Um, we work really closely with, uh, with all the commissions on that. Um, this year was the last year of the five-year or a science research cluster where the government of Canada and and provincial commission dollars are merged, you know, in a in a mar in a cost shared program to do uh, agronomic research. So that program comes to an end this March, and uh, the Canola Council has coordinated the work of putting a new application together for the next five year period, working with each of the provincial commissions, including the Manitoba Can Canola Growers Association. We also help coordinate the canola, canola agri agronomic research program, CARP, um, and are involved in a number of other uh, uh, pieces of work around uh, around science and innovation from that point of view. 
Then the other part of it, and, and Rick mentioned this too, is the work in the regulatory side. You know, we're bringing a message to the government that we cannot be competitive externally, competitive in global markets if we don't have a regulatory system in Canada that's positive and growth oriented for our industry. So that includes making sure that crop protection products are not removed from the tool gate to tool gate, uh, toolbox for growers. Um, being sure that the regulatory systems are as uh, as uh, efficient and uh, responsive as possible. So a lot of effort being spent on the PMRA issues, uh, issues like Lambda and, and the reevaluations uh, that are underway, the PMRA for crop protection products and regulatory systems such as the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's framework for regulating gene edited products and so on. So a, a very big effort into that. You know, canola is all based on innovation um, and uh, and we need to be sure that the government of Canada provides an innovation, an innovative framework. Um, and a big part of that, uh, Rick also mentioned the work being done on sustainability, and and uh, we partner with the CCGA and, and the provincial commissions a lot on that. We also really take a lens from a from a customer point of view. And one of the things that's happened during my time here as the president of the Canola Council is uh, the interest that our customers have in these issues around the carbon emission reduction and sustainability have become much more pronounced. So, so our effort in this space, um, Rick mentioned the Carbon Alliance and, and the work being done kind of on domestic regulatory issues, and that's really critical work that's being done well by the CCGA. Our focus is on um, how do we um, engage and respond to the questions that are coming from the Japanese and from, uh, you know, the big uh, oil oil purchasing food companies and so on, when they're asking questions about our strategies around emission reduction, sustainability measures and so on, because their shareholders and their customers are asking those kinds of questions. So uh, we're, we, we're working in that area is how do we respond to those? And I think what our customers mostly want to see is that we can manage the discussion that's taking place around those issues and at the same time continue to provide them with the reliable supply of our quality product, which is what they really want. They want access to that product without, without the challenges and, and incursions that can take place as a result of these environmental issues. So that's largely what we're doing. One of the last thing I'd mention is, is that we've got a big convention coming up in March. March, what are the dates? 7th to 9th in Ottawa, and uh, we, we partner with the Canadian uh, uh, Gray, Canada Grains Council as partners in delivery of the crop uh, conventions taking place in Ottawa, uh, March 7th to 9th, and hope everybody can make it. It's great to be able to be back in person and see people. And so um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. Look forward to any questions, I guess, after now or no, now. No, Except get white up here too. <laughs> yeah. No. So Rick will join us here. And so now's your opportunity to ask questions. Jen's going to moderate. So Jen, go ahead. If you have questions, please uh, make your way in the room to the two mics and you know, flag me at the table if something comes up online. Okay. Hi, Ian. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Everyone, uh, it's an honor to take part in a, a conversation. It's like a large coffee shop uh, conversation. There's so many topics that you've brought up, and uh, we feel pressured to be so little time to take on all of these important questions. Uh, a while back, uh, you know, we're putting farmers first. Uh, the farmers here passed the resolution that uh, we do our own work and take over some uh, canola varieties so that we're not overcharged for our seeds. Uh, how is this uh, effort uh, progressing? We uh, we want to be using uh, you know as fewer chemicals and in charge of uh, looking after our crops. Uh, there's a variety of canola that has got a hairy uh, hairy condition that uh, prevents the flea beetles from uh, chewing so much on our crops. Uh, this is a beneficial idea for uh, the uh, breeding of our crops. Where is the effort of this organization and the Canola Council of Canada to support uh, uh, systems of farming that use less chemicals in our, um, you know, a farming system that's not so dangerous for the environment? Because, you know, the first thing that we do as farmers is we need the environment. Thanks, Ian. I believe Chuck. 
Okay, and uh, I guess going to your first question, which was dealing with, uh, I guess, the organization getting into the breeding and supplying of seed for uh, new varieties. We looked at that. We uh, were looking at open pollinated varieties because as I remember it, the uh, motion was talking about, you know, providing low cost seed that farmers can reuse. We looked at it and there was such a large yield difference between those open pollinated varieties that we could access and the hybrid varieties that existed. Uh, I believe we did report to the uh, the membership at, at the time, there's about a 30% difference in yield. And we just felt that the yield difference, nobody would want to grow those varieties. And the cost of developing a variety we felt was not where we wanted to spend our money. When it comes to the hairy canola, that hairy canola variety that was developed uh, a number of years ago by some researchers, it is, was a transgenic variety that would have required approval to get registered by all the importing companies, if I remember correctly. However, we are continuing to fund some research. I was at Canola Week last November in uh, Saskatoon, and they are developing varieties that are not transgenetic, that do express that hairy gene uh, that would help deal with flea beetles. It's not commercialized yet. It's still very early in the research process, but we continue to provide funding for that. So do you have anything to add to that, Jim? Not on the specific issues that, that I'm not as close to, but I, I would say that um, a great deal of the research underway, and I mentioned the five-year cluster program that we're involved in in now, uh, the new application, uh, a, a, lot, a great deal of that work is, uh, is directed towards sustainability and, uh, and sustainable practices. And that's been a priority that the government has uh, put in place for that program. So though getting into the specifics, I think um, the, the only way of getting addressing these issues is through innovation, is through doing the science and understanding the issue and innovating in, in this area. And so the investment that the growers are making in, in this research work and the government of Canada is making as these matching programs is critical to us finding solutions in those areas of my mind. Morning, Butch. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. You're sure about that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're paying. Anyway, uh, I believe the, the uh, question was asked here about varieties. I, I believe we passed a resolution here, and that's what the previous speaker was talking about. Uh, I don't think our resolution said it was any particular kind of varieties. We just wanted, at that time, I believe the membership wanted the uh, the, the manager of canola growers to look at developing not any specific variety, but owning varieties. And I know I know that it's, it's not that easy, but owning we should look, owning varieties, and then the revenues therefrom would go into further research. That's I believe how it was. I don't think it was specific to any variety. Um, Rick mentioned crop inputs, and I on one of the list of five, and I believe five was inputs. I think if you had asked the farmers in this room. One of the major concerns that we have now, although we're getting very good prices for our product, is the increase in input costs. And uh, and that is, and I also understand that CAP is involved with the um, a program through the Federation of Agriculture to look at that. And what really farmers think is, sure, lots of costs have increased because of the pandemic and stuff, but generally we think that we are getting ripped off on fertilizer costs. And I just want to know how that's coming, if we're making any headways there, although that's a big hill to climb, I understand that. And Rick, you can give us all the answers to this. First of all, I don't know all the answers to Butch, but thanks. Um, no, I, I mean, your point's taken. Um, you know, when we uh, look at farm inputs, um, and by the way, that list was not in any particular order. I grouped them according to the managers, so uh, I wouldn't take uh, take that as a signal that it's low on the on the on the list. Um, you know, fertilizer prices. I mean, they we know how expensive that is, and um, 
we know the disruptions in the world and we know the disruptions with Russian sourced product um, supply chain issues. I'm not making excuses. It is too expensive. Um, but at the same time, if these levels of fertilizer persist longer term, then innovation needs to come in to use less fertilizer without the yield drag. And so um, that's the long game. I, I don't believe that there's a regulatory approach that would make a lot of sense um, to, to deal with that. But I think in my view, as long as farmers have their innovative toolbox full of options for you, whether it's not using fertilizer or using less fertilizer or using seeds that you require less fertilizer, I'm a strong advocate of giving you individually all the tools at your disposal to do the right thing on your particular farm. Not necessarily um, a process uh, type of approach to things, but an outcomes based, right? You know the best mix for your farm. You know the best management practice. You know what you need to do individually. I think our job here is to make sure that you have all of the options available, whether it's genetic modification, gene editing, organic, agroecology, you name it. Um, I don't care about the process. I care about the outcomes. And I think we also care about the outcomes. So the outcome of having too high a fertilizer prices will encourage you to look for other options that are available to you to help mitigate that. But I, I do know that it is high on the, on the radar screen, especially when sanctions were put on fertilizer from Russia because of the war. And the fertilizer price went up because the government taxed it. Um, that caused a problem for the farmers, particularly in the East, but the law of one price holds, so it kind of impacts everybody, I believe. Um, but again, long term, I agree with you, Butch, fertilizers prices are too high. That's probably a supply issue uh, that needs to be resolved around the world, and we just need more supply of fertilizer to bring that price down. To remind you of one of the other options is compatible with soybeans. Yeah, yeah, you you have that option, right? And and when the when the demand for fertilizer goes down, the price will come down too. So so yeah, the market should work. Thank you. We're going to take one more question um, here at the AGM, but please know if you have additional questions, there'll be board members and staff around um, afterwards. Carrie, we're going to line. Oh, I don't want to take up the last question <laughs> then. <laughs> you are you are welcome. Okay. Um, Gerilyn Witcher is the Manitoba cooperator. It's always a chance uh, when I ask a question in a room of, full of farmers that I'm the only one who doesn't know the answer, but I will ask anyway. Um, uh, both, Rick, you mentioned how busy both organizations have been lobbying. Um, so this question is both for you and for Jim. Um, why have you guys been so busy? Like, is that normal? And um, secondly, uh, where have you seen the most success or progress? So uh, the Rick should comment. We're busy because, um, you know, I think Canada is probably one of the one of the places where the the, the, the diversification between people who live in cities, and people who live in countries is as big as, as broad as, uh, as any, any other democracy, if you like, or any, you know, country. So we're, uh, Canada's just announced they're going to bring in 500,000 people next year as new immigrants. They're pretty much all going to go to cities so that, you know, farms are getting bigger with less people. So there are, you know, our situation there is a challenge. So we need to be there, especially with a government that is really a city government, you know, like uh, don't have a lot of rural members, frankly. Um, we really have to be active to remind them all the time about the importance of agriculture, um, the economic impact that the agricultural industry has on the economy in general, um, the quality of the products we we produce when it comes to these issues around sustainability and globally. You know, we are very sustainable producers of agricultural products in Canada. And if we're restricted in our ability to grow those products, then they're going to grow somewhere else where the sustainability practices are, are less good and their sustainability metrics are less than Canadian. It doesn't make any sense. And we need to be able to explain those things to, you know, to politicians and, and, and people in government. So, so that's why we're stepping up and really being active. And CCJ and the Canola Council and the Canada Grains Council are all 
co-inhabiting an office in Ottawa. So we're together where we can work together on these issues and make sure we're collaborated and focused on the work that we're doing. So that would be my answer. If I could just take one sec, Rick. I'd like to recognize Chris Mancher and Courtney Boychuk, who are, are stand-up people, um, our agronomy specialists uh, that work here in Manitoba. And I meant to, to introduce them in our uh, in my speak, speaking notes earlier on and forgot, but um, you know they're the answers to all our agronomy issues and so on here in the province and the work that's being done currently on flea beetles. And Chris is one of our major people on our research agenda. Um, or the wilt and so on are also issues. So I just wanted to make sure people all knew that they were in the room and um, they're part of our agronomy team here in Manitoba. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, part, part of the activity was we're getting back to face-to-face -face meetings. So we need to reestablish face-to-face meetings in a bigger way. Um, so that did occur to a larger degree. Also, from at least CCJA's perspective, I mean, the list of, of issues is long, right? Um, we've also strategically broadened out our message and influence to other non-typical offices, like outside of agriculture, outside of, of uh, the trade, the trade minister's office. Um, we've expanded even like, you know, further into economic development, making sure that people and politicians in those areas understand what's going on. The health department gets a little more attention now because of PMRA issues. Um, uh, like, you know, the Prairies Economic Development Canada target, um, we targeted that uh, a little more strongly. So we've cast the net further and creating, um, I guess, messages and influence beyond just the core that we normally would do in a strategy to make sure our voice is heard even more broadly because all these departments at the federal level seem to be intertwined and interlinked and environment and sustainability is in every department you know, including finance right so we're it's a concerted effort to broaden out our scope too mm -hmm. maybe i'll just add my small opinion to this is fact is that right now you know because of the pandemic food security is becoming a greater interest uh climate change carbon se sequestration is another growing issue with uh industries the food processors and they all are looking at agriculture to either play a part of the reduction in carbon emissions or to help sequester the carbon out of the air and into the soil so as Rick and Jim have indicated, this affects many different departments than what we used to traditionally deal with, which was the Department of Agriculture and maybe health when it came to PRMA and a little bit of trade. So, you know, it's just right now, sustainability, food security, climate change are all very hot topics with the government. And that's what causing a lot of the activities that uh, council and canola growers are dealing with. So, uh, Ian, uh, I, I'm afraid you have to order, say... Order, Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect to everybody, I think it's important that this is the only time that we come together to discuss all of these important issues. And very briefly, I want to say about sustainability and carbon, that if you ask farmers directly about that, that's one of their most important concerns when it comes to raising their crops and being profitable while they do it. And uh, if you ask the National Farmers Union... Uh, which has happened, and we have written uh, the Farmers Union a report uh, called Tackling the Farm Crisis and Tackling the Climate Crisis. Uh, you will see uh, the viewpoints of many, many scientists and uh, farmers on uh, what can be done over our, our climate challenge and all of the issues associated with that, which everyone, this is all hands on deck. There's an emergency situation in the in our climate. Uh, Greta Thunberg has sent this for us, and it's important that all farmers understand this. Uh, the the uh, population understands this. You have it's a important. question, Ian, because we have to move along with the meeting. We're the running. The question out of time. is that we cannot do uh, justice to all of these topics in a very short time in a meeting like this, and it's uh, it's important that farmers come together because we have a different agenda from industry and we want to have our voice uh, part of the uh, solution, obviously. So the question is that you're not taking into account the viewpoints of farmers uh, 
in the way that they should be. Because uh, while we're doing this work as farmers raising crops, it's also about net farm income. It's not about gross production. Uh, gross production helps, but that also makes big profits for the trade, obviously. So it's important to expose all of these points and have proper discussion about it so that farmers understand the job that we're doing. And that's about uh, you know helping the communities. And if we get less and less farmers involved in the world, that's a Ian, problem. Ian, we're running out of time. As I said, we're, we're limiting the questions. And if you have a question, state it briefly. Uh, we don't have time to listen to uh, a long discussion at this point. I'm sorry. Well, I appreciate that. So the question is that we need to account for uh, the viewpoints of all farmers and all of the public. It's not just about a trade issue. So how can you widen your consultations and, uh, and do that in a form like this where those issues need to be discussed because the time allowed here is too short. So I'm saying we need longer time, don't we, to discuss this. Okay, you're right. It is uh, not the right forum for this type of discussion, uh, but I do believe like, you know, we there are a number of consultations ongoing. There's the code of practice where farmers have the opportunity to voice their opinions and comments. There's also the upcoming uh, was Canadian Sustainable Agricultural Strategy that is a virtual meeting that is open to all farmers to join in. So I think, you know, there are opportunities for farmers' voice to be heard. If you listen to that presentation yesterday about uh, agricultural strategy or what it was called and how organizations work together to have the farmers' voice heard, you will see that there's a broad coalition of farm organizations that represent all commodity groups, all provinces that are lobbying the government when it comes to these issues of sustainability and climate change and everything else that deals with maintaining profitability for farmers and at the same time supporting sustainability. Uh, is there anything you gentlemen like to add? Very, very briefly, Ian, um, good to see you by the way. Um, Rest assured that CCGA speaks with a grower voice. We collaborate with the industry, with council and all this stuff, but collaboration doesn't mean that we are silenced. And so CCGA, MCGA, we have a very clear grower voice on your behalf that doesn't replace your own voice at some of these uh, uh, opportunities that Chuck pointed out. So please know that your voice is being heard in many venues, especially through this organization and, and even the MCGA, because Sometimes we just disagree with the industry, and and but that doesn't mean we don't work with industry because we're stronger together. But that doesn't mean the voice is not heard, respected, or listened to. And that's why CCJ is here. Thank you. Okay. Once again, thank you, Rick and Jim, for your presentations and for answering questions. Jim, thanks for the moderation, but we do have to move on. And the directors and staff will be available after uh, the, the annual meeting's finished to further uh, discuss your concerns or try and answer your questions. Uh, next on the agenda, we will move into financials. To do that, I will now turn the meeting over to our treasurer, Jack Fraze. Thank you, Chuck. I'm happy to share the 2021-2022 audited financials. If you find the images on the screen hard to read, you can follow along with a printed copy in your folder. For those joining virtually, a link can be found in the chat. As well, the copy that you have, there's a QR code on there. You can scan it with your phone and uh, it'll pop up uh, the annual meeting uh, with the financials. We will answer questions at the end of the report. If you are online, you can type your question into the Q&A uh, feature. I would now like to welcome our accountant, Alex George. So he will now walk us through the audited financials. Great, uh, good morning. Uh, so we'll start with uh, for the opinion on the audited statements, uh, it was unqualified, uh, meaning that 
the statements were presented fairly in all material respects. Uh, so if we go to the next slide there. All right, uh, for the statement to financial position, uh, the bank, it was down uh, 754,000. Uh, for investments, uh, the total of the wind down, the revenue reserve and unrestricted, the total fair market value is 5.8. Uh, with the cost base of 5.3 million. Uh, last year, there's the fair market value of 6 million with a cost base of 5.1. Uh, going into the receivables, uh, checkoff receivables were fairly consistent uh, with the trade uh, receivables being fairly consistent as well. Uh, the bulk of the trade receivables being the Alberta Canola and Sask uh, Canola Development Co. Uh, in regards to the National Market Development Project. Uh, for prepaids, uh, that was fairly consistent in the year, 391,000. Uh, the top three items would be uh, the investment with Prairie Innovation Center of 100,000, uh, the PSI Lab funding of 236,000, and a Crop Connect carry forward from last year from the cancellation of 31,000. Uh, into the capital assets, uh, there was just a few items purchased around $6,000 uh, consisting of uh, conference video camera and laptops and iPads. Uh, so total assets within the organization is 7 million. If you can go to the next slide, there we go. Uh, accounts uh, payable and accruals uh, was sitting at 429,000, a significant drop from last year, essentially a timing of the payment to the Canola Council of Canada of 295,000. Uh, wages included in that, wages payable of 60000 and checkoff refunds included in that of 83000 The prior year was 138000 for checkoff refunds. Uh, going into deferred checkoff revenues, uh, so this was the checkoffs received in the current year. Net of refunds uh, is $2.2 so it's a significant drop uh, from the prior year of $3.3 uh, Into net assets. I invested in net capital assets, 27,000. Uh, internally restricted net assets for possible wind down is 540,000. Uh, the internally restricted net assets for the revenue reserve uh, used was 153,000 and allocated from the current year was 288. Uh, so overall it was up uh, 135,000. Uh, so total liabilities and net assets within the organization is 7 million as well. And go to the next slide there. Uh, this is the statement of changes in net assets. Uh, the allocation of the net income for the year is seen on the bottom line. Invested in capital assets, a negative 9,000 for the amortization. The internally restricted funds, uh, an overall increase of 135, which was the use of 153 and allocation of 288. And then unrestricted from operations, 160. Three, so an overall net income of 288 for the year. We can go to the next slide. Uh, revenues, uh, checkoff revenues uh, was 3.3 million. Uh, this was collected in the prior year and recognized in the current year. Uh, investments, uh, 252,000, fairly consistent with the prior year. That's a 4.6% return on investment if you go income over cost. Uh, last year is 4.27. And the pest surveillance initiative funding, uh, 77,000 was received for that. Uh, noted this year, uh, the national market development uh, revenue uh, was allocated and netted against expenses for this year. Um, into the expenses, everything was actually on budget and under budget for the current year. Um, you'll note uh, the Canola Council of Canada, uh, those drops were slightly uh, due to uh, drop in fees for the year. Um, and most notably, the unrealized uh, investment gains or losses, there was a loss of 700, 472,000 in unrealized losses. Uh, it is a conservative uh, portfolio, uh, so there is uh, over 60% in bonds, and as interest rates rise, bonds take a hit, so there was a significant loss there. Uh, so it brings you to a net uh, income of 288. You go to the next slide there. Uh, this is detailing the schedule of expenses. 
Uh, for Board of Governance, most notable uh, professional fees up. There was the election, uh, so there was legal fees around 14000 and the election of 58000 cost. Uh, administration, office personnel, uh, fairly consistent with the year, uh, only an 8% increase. Uh, for market development, uh, fairly consistent and on budget. We can go to the next slide. Uh, for advocacy, uh, fairly consistent with the prior year, there was uh, an increase in extension for 65,000 and youth programming to 69,000. Uh, and communication, uh, the major jump was an association promotion as a lot of promotional materials were purchased. And then grower engagement uh, did increase in the year. Uh, you'll note uh, trade shows, uh, egg days around 5,000 and meetings increased to around uh, six to 7,000. And uh, grower engagement sponsorship did take a large jump. Uh, there was a number of donations around 18,000 along with donations to the farmer wellness and to the egg safety programs. Next slide. Uh, for the research uh, schedule of expenses, uh, the Manitoba Weed Survey uh, was executed and the reserve funds were used for that. Um, you'll note the Prairie Crops and Soil Research Facility, uh, no donation in the current year. That was the, to the U of M in the prior year. Uh, so total research of 864,000. And next, we'll get into the notes of the financial statements. Uh, just noting the details for the internally restricted investments. Uh, a lot of the items were used up for the research reserve, the election reserve. Uh, so there is an overall uh, 1 million sitting in reserves uh, for future shortfalls. And the wind down is still sitting at 540,000. We go to the next slide. Uh, this just details uh, the transactions and the use of the internally restricted reserves. Uh, just noting for 2022, uh, there's the allocation 288 was uh, set aside for future shortfalls and then applied uh, this year was the research funds, selections, and use of the 2021 uh, projection funds. We can go to the next slide there. Uh, restrictions on net assets, just noting uh, the board transactions. Uh, so $540,000 set aside for uh, possible shortfalls or wind down. And uh, these uses are not available for any other use uh, unless for board approval. Uh, to the next slide. Uh, for here, deferred checkoff revenues. Uh, so gross checkoff revenues received in the current year, 2.4 million. Uh, checkoff refunds to producers, 226,000. Uh, so that's a 9.11%. And that's fairly consistent over the years. That's been 9.11, 9.44, 9 9.29. Uh, so fairly consistent around the 9%. And if we can go to the next, oh, there. Oh, uh, back one there. Yep. Uh, for commitments. Uh, Still into it, uh, 2023 estimated core funding, 449,000, and over the next four years is gonna be 1.4 million. Uh, included in that 1.4 is the commitment to the PSI lab of 225,000 per year until fiscal 2025, uh, although that is on prorated basis, depending upon the funding received. We'll go to the next slide. And here is your actual versus budget for the year. Um, the most notable items is administration was under budget by 78 or over, yeah, under budget by 78,000. Market development was under budget as well by 399,000 and grower engagement and extension was under budget by 113,000. And noted in here, uh, the investment fees are not included 52,000 and the amortization of 9,000, which brings you to the total expenses within the year of 2.8 million. And that is the financials in review. I tried to be uh, quick and concise. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Alex. Uh, oh, Alex, maybe stay up here just in case there are questions. If there are any questions, you can uh, address them to Alex and myself. Seeing none, 
Thank you, Alice. I will now make the motion to accept the financial report for the 2021-2022 year as presented. And I'm looking for a seconder. Brian Chorney, any comments or questions? Seeing none, then we will uh, go to the vote. Got the online stuff going, Carrie? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? We're good. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, I'm now looking for a motion to appoint DF George as the auditor for the MCGA for the financial period ending July 31st, 2023. Pam, second pick. Uh, Robert Misko. That's uh, moved by Pam Bailey, uh, seconded by Robert Misko. Any further discussion? Not a we'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That, that carries. And we'll now turn the meeting back over to Chuck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. I know our meeting is running a little long, but we do have a few other items of business we need to deal with. MCGA board would like to propose two amendments to our bylaws that we have identified as an opportunity to simplify the process during our AGMs and during the elections. I am seeking a motion to approve the following changes. First is a new clause 2.08 that confirms MCGA's ability to act as an agent on behalf of its members for the scientific research and experimental discovery tax credit. To provide farmers with a CRA approved tax credit on their checkoff each year, we currently vote on this motion each year and adding it to our bylaws would save time at each AGM and align with the bylaws of other commodity groups in Manitoba. The second amendment is intended to reduce barriers for farmers considered running for election on the MCG board by reducing the number of required signatures from six down to three. I am looking for a motion from the floor to support the amendment amending the MCJ bylaws to include a new clause 2.08 and the rewording of clause 6.03 E3 as proposed by the board. Could I have a mover, please? Bill Nicholson and a seconder. Pam Bailey. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing no discussion, I will now call for the vote on the motion to amend the MCGA bylaws to include a new clause 2.08 and the rewording of clause 6.03 C3. All those in favor, please indicate. Opposed? I declare that motion carried. So we'll move on to resolutions at this time. We did not receive any resolutions by the deadline of January 30th. I will just pause here to see if there are any resolutions being brought forward from the floor in the room or virtually. A reminder to our membership that any resolutions brought to the meeting from the floor must receive a 90% approval from eligible voters to be dealt with at this meeting. So why will we wait? Oh, okay, we got a resolution from the floor. Go ahead, Nicola. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Um, the resolution is as follows. I believe there's also a slide with the wording if that can be put up. Whereas farmers need to match genetics to need to optimize their crop management, whereas canola disease genetics labeling 
is not readily available to farmers. Therefore, be it resolved that MCGA encourage the canola seed industry to provide information on canola disease genetics to farmers. So that's the motion. We need a seconder. Lindsay Friesen. I'm sorry, what was the name? Lindsay Friesen. Okay, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Now, before we can debate the resolution, I need the permission of the floor to deal with this resolution. We need a 90% approval to, to, so that this can be dealt with at this time. So all those in favor of dealing with this resolution, please indicate, and we're gonna have to take a quick count. Okay, do we have 90% there? Uh... Because <laughs> they got to compare the counts here with the number of members that are present at the meeting. And are there, you got the, the count so the people, Okay, I think we can put, yep, we're just gonna lower your hands and, on, and just for form's sake, I'll ask any opposed. Okay, I only see a couple opposed, so it's probably passed. It's not enough? Okay. I'm sorry, it, we cannot debate it. I guess some of our members have either left or didn't abstain, or they abstain from voting. Uh, if you abstain, that is considered uh, a, a no vote. So therefore, we are gonna move on to the rest of our reports. So uh, I'd like to give you a brief update on the most recent resolutions from 2021 regarding uh, mandatory export sales reporting. This is a resolution that was passed at our previous annual meeting. Export sales reporting was brought forward as part of CCGA's position on the Canada Grain Act and the Canadian Grain Commission modernization. It was supported by MCGA and other provincial grower groups. In 2021, CCGA looked at options for for different actors who could collect the information and create messages to support CC, CGC's role in marketing transparency using this kind of reporting. CCGA and MCGA continue to raise the, the ask where applicable, but there have been limited platforms to engage on the data aspect of the review. CCGA's plan is to promote this as a reform to the Canada Grains Act as there will be an opportunity to clarify the CGC statistical mandate and discuss market transparency and producers. In January of 2023, meeting with the CGC, the question was raised about export sales reporting and CGC shared that it is currently outside their mandate. They are limited in their ability to engage on it. Also in 2021, SAS Canola Groups Oh, pardon me, SAS crop groups engage mercantile consulting to look at data requirements for transparent markets, which highlight export data and sales reporting. There is interest from multiple groups and we continue to pursue this ask. So uh, I'll ask this time, are there any uh, resolutions from the floor that have come online? Nothing from there. So we move on to other business. Just trying to get up to date here on my script. Uh, okay. I don't think we have to deal with this one. Yeah. 
Okay, as we have approval to update the bylaws, we will not need to vote on the uh, shred prep motion. I want to remind all members that once approved by Canada Revenue Agency, the SR and ED letters will be available on our website for you to share with your accountant. As funders of all MCGA research, you are eligible to get a tax credit for the eligible research projects. We have applied for a credit of 14.2% and we'll let you know when we receive approval. Up next, I would like to call for a motion to ratify the actions of the association. We are looking for a mover and seconder on this motion. So could I have a mover to ratify the actions of the board for the previous year? Brian Charney and Ron Cron. Seconds. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate. All those opposed, and that's carried. Again, uh, well, I think we only have one person in virtual. I should be checking with them all the time, but I keep forgetting. We'd also like to offer congratulations to our Canola Award of Excellence winner this year, Dr. Michael Eskin. We had the privilege of celebrating Dr. Eskin last night at our Crop Connect banquet. I hope everyone was able to participate. Dr. Eskin was selected for his active role in the development of canola oil and for his continuous work on improving the oil throughout his career. So at this point, unless there are any other questions, I will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone for attending the meeting. A reporting of this meeting will be made available on our website in the coming days. So thank you everyone and please enjoy the rest of Crop Connect.